Hello and welcome to Lighting for Digital Video. I'm Eric Hyton and I've been working as a Director of Photography and Lighting Cameraman in broadcast television for the past 20 years. And during that time I've worked on commercials, documentaries and drama. And uh, what I hope to do in the next half hour or so is show you the basics, which hopefully will give you the fundamentals of effective lighting. One of the most important elements in the design of a film or television image is light. Now, obviously, without any light at all, we simply won't see an image. So at its very least, we need light to expose the film or the CCD or whatever medium we're using. But light is a lot more than that. And if you start to consider the direction the light's coming from, its colour, whether it's soft, hard, whether it's bounce off something reflected or direct, then you can see that light actually presents itself in many ways. And it's our job to understand those ways and manipulate them so we can then produce effective and creative lighting. One of the most important elements in the design of a film or television image is light. Apart from its fundamental role of illuminating the subject, it provides colour, shape and texture. It provides balance and contrast and outline shape. And so you can begin to see how important light is. In fact, you could say it's the key pictorial force in any film or television image. Before getting into the demonstrations, I just want to point out a couple of things. Firstly, a common mistake people make in video lighting is to assume that the camcorder is going to react to the scene in the same way as your eyes, when in reality this just isn't the case. And if you don't know about the huge difference between your eyes and the camcorder, then your lighting is never going to look right. To start with, your eyes register images that are around 350 times more detailed than a television screen and with a contrast range that's around eight times larger. Secondly, if you were to compare your eyes to the CCD chips in your camcorder, there's a huge difference. Whereas a CCD chip is just 720 by 576 pixels, which is around 0.35 megapixels, your eye is equivalent to around 11,000 by 11,000 pixels, which is around 120 megapixels. Compare that to the best 35mm film movie format, which on a good day will reproduce 3000 by 3000 pixels, and well, you can clearly see that your eyes are seriously high definition. The point to all this is that when you're lighting a scene, by all means use your eyes when positioning the lights. But if you have the means, connect a small colour monitor to the output of your camcorder so that you can see exactly what the camcorder is seeing. And if you don't have a monitor, then at least go back to the viewfinder and check that after you've made any adjustments. So for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm going to be using this Sony VX2000 camera. Now, it's a 3CCD chip camera, and it records onto the mini DV format, so the picture quality is actually very good. And the good thing about this camera also is that it's readily available and actually quite affordable. Most cameras have a fully automatic mode, in which decisions about exposure and focus and colour balance are made by the camera. Now, whilst this can occasionally be useful, it's normally better to turn the automatic mode off and use the camera in fully manual mode. And in this way, you get control over the image. And most of the time, you're going to get better results. Because we're using a monitor as a reference for our lighting, it's essential that that monitor is correctly calibrated. If you don't do this, you might find yourself in a situation where, for instance, the brightness on that monitor is set way too high. And then you adjust your lighting so the pictures look correct on that monitor. What happens later is you go and review your pictures on a monitor with the brightness set lower and your pictures look very dark and underexposed and obviously we want to avoid that. So now we're going to set this monitor up and the first thing to do is switch the output of the camera to colour bars and then we get a colour bar scale on the monitor and then go to the monitor and turn out all of the colour so we have a black and white grayscale image. Then find the brightness control and turn the brightness up until the black bar on the right becomes grey which is wrong and then you turn it back until it becomes a good solid black. And then you go to the um, contrast at the other end and looking at the white bar here turn that one down so the white bar becomes grey and then turn the white contrast back up again till the white bar becomes just white but you're not going too far beyond that point. And then for the colour, there's a little bit of guesswork involved here really, it's not very precise. 
turn the colour up until you get a nice saturated colour image. And one thing to look out for is the yellow bar, which should be sort of a lemon yellow. It shouldn't have any tinge of green or um, orange in it. And the magenta bar also should be magenta without any red or purple. And that's an indication of the colour being set correctly. And that's the monitor set up for the day. In order to achieve pictures that are the right colour, you first of all need to perform a white balance in the lighting conditions that you're going to use to shoot that scene. And what this does is gives the camera a reference what is true white in those lighting conditions. And then it adjusts all the other colours so they're correct relative to that white. So I'm going to ask Mara to hold this white card. Now it is important to use a proper reference white card as opposed to say a, a t-shirt or a piece of white paper because they might not actually be correct white and if they're not true white then you're going to get slightly different colour temperature. Here we are using tungsten lights which give out a colour temperature of 3200 degrees Kelvin. Frame the card so that it fills at least 80% of the picture area. Adjust the camera iris so that the white is pure white but not overexposed and then follow the white balance procedure for your camera. I'd like briefly to talk about colour temperature so that you understand why a white balance is necessary. Normal domestic light bulbs such as you find in the home are actually orange when compared to daylight. You've probably seen this effect if you're walking down a street at dusk and you look inside a house and the light inside appears warmer or more orange compared to that of the outside. And similarly, if you're inside looking out, the daylight will appear colder or bluer compared to the orange light inside. So these different types of light, daylight and tungsten, are described by their colour temperature. Daylight is 5,600 degrees Kelvin and tungsten is 3,200 degrees Kelvin. Now, whilst our eyes are very good at compensating for this automatically, the camera needs to be given a white reference for the lighting conditions it's in. And that's what we've done here. And we've done a white balance in 3,200 degrees Kelvin tungsten lighting. So now we're going to look at some lighting units. All the lighting units we'll use in this demonstration are tungsten lights, and therefore have a color temperature of 3,200 degrees Kelvin. One of my favorite units is the Dido light. The great thing about Dido lights is that they are small and yet very powerful and they produce a lovely quality of light which is easy to manipulate. You can also focus the lens which allows you to alter the size of the beam. Dido lights run off a small transformer which plugs into a domestic 13 amp supply so you can straight away run up to four Dido lights. The other lamps I'm going to show you are known as redheads and blondes originally named this way because for years the 800 watt redhead had a red plastic casing and the 2000 watt blonde had a yellow plastic casing. Nowadays they come in all sorts of different colours but these terms are generally used to describe these lamps today. So having chosen the lighting unit we're going to use we now need to understand how to control the light it produces. We can manipulate this light in many ways. We can alter its shape, its colour, its intensity and the quality of light coming from the lamp. We need to understand these aspects fully if we're going to produce pleasing and effective lighting. The quality of light produced by either a natural or an artificial light source generally falls into one of two categories. It can be either hard light or soft light. Direct sunlight or light from an open face redhead are both examples of hard light sources. They produce strong shadows and they're good for revealing texture and shape but they can be unflattering on people, especially on faces. Direct sunlight, when obscured by cloud, becomes soft and the shadows become much less pronounced. You can achieve the same effect by softening a hard source such as our redhead by placing diffusion material over the barn doors. If you look at the shadow cast by this desk lamp, you can see it's very harsh. Now if I take this diffusion material, which is a piece of Lee Filter 216, and place it over the barn doors, you can see the shadows become softer and a lot less pronounced. So that's without any diffusion, and then with the diffusion, so the hard light source in effect becomes a soft light source. 
So we can see the same effect here on Mara. There she's lit by the open-faced redhead and you can see the hard shadows on her nose. If I now put the diffusion material in front of the barn doors, you can see that the light becomes softer and generally more flattering. So that's with diffusion there and without. And then again with the diffusion material. A soft light source is generally more flattering on faces. It's also used to fill in shadows created by hard light and for reducing the overall contrast in a scene. By using different filters, you can adjust the degree to which your light is diffused, from a very light silk through to a very heavy frost. It's about choosing the effect you want and which is most pleasing to the eye. The best thing to do is experiment with different types of filter and familiarise yourself with their effects. One way to achieve a very nice soft effect is to use one of these. This is a soft box and it's made by Lasterlite. Now it's a purpose-made unit that fits onto the front of your lamp and it's made from a heat-resistant material, so it can stay on the lamp quite happily all day. But if it does get a little hot, you can open these vents at the side and let some heat out. It's a very useful type of fixture and it's one I use frequently for lighting interviews and for portraiture. Now I'm going to talk about ways of controlling light. It's one thing to simply switch a light on, point it at your subject and achieve a basic exposure, but there's a lot more to it if you're going to create pleasing and effective lighting. You need to control the way the light falls on the scene. For instance, you might deliberately want to keep part of the scene in shadow, and you can do this by using the barn doors, or if you need more precise control, you can use a flag. Barn doors fit to the front of the lamp, and they're used to mask off light from parts of the set and to shape the beam. A word of warning though, barn doors can get very hot, so you might want to keep a pair of rigger's gloves handy when adjusting them. So flags do much the same job as barn doors, but they do allow you more precise control. So this is a flag, it's a piece of black material and the light can't pass through it and it fits on a frame and this frame can then fit into a stand. It's very simple, all you do really is put it in front of the lamp and it creates shadow patterns that you can then control. So here's a flag on a stand and all you do is very simply bring it in, place it in front of the lamp you want to control and then you can see by raising it you can move the position of the shadow to exactly where you want it to be. If you bring it a little closer to the lamp, you'll find that the shadow gets softer. And again, you could just adjust it exactly as you wish. So flags really come into their own when you're using a lamp like this, which has been diffused. And I've made this hard source into a soft source by using a piece of Lee filter on the front. And so what you now can't do is use the barn doors because they're behind that filter. So if you want to control that beam and shape it in any way, you have to use a flag. So you can bring the flag into place and create a shadow exactly where you want it to be. And you'll see the shadow is a lot softer now because we've got the diffusion on the lamp. If I bring the flag even closer to the lamp, you'll see again that the shadow gets a lot softer. And then you can use it to make a nice gradation on the background exactly where you wish it to be. Something we often use in lighting are gels which fit on the front of the lamps. These can be diffusion filters, which we've already talked about. They can be colour correction filters or effects colours. Now, effects colours do exactly what they say. They give a coloured effect to the lamp and they come in many different hues. Here we've got colours ranging from blue through greens, ambers, pinks, magentas. In fact, pretty much any colour you can think of can be achieved this way. They can be useful for adding splashes of colour to a scene or the set or for simulating light from, say, a neon sign or a street lamp. It's often easier to take a piece of gel and simply clip it to the front of the barn doors. 
using crop clips or even wooden clothes pegs. If you are going to use colours like this on your lamps, it's important to remember to white balance before you put the gels onto the barn doors. In this way you'll get a true white and you'll also retain the colour effects of the gels. One of the main things we need to do with our lights is control their brightness. And again, this can be done in several ways. The easiest way is to take a piece of neutral density gel and simply clip it to the barn doors. In this way, you can reduce the light output by one, two or three stops, depending on the density of the gel used. And the great thing about neutral density gel is that it changes the light output, but it doesn't alter the colour of the lamp. You could also use an inline dimmer to reduce the power going to the lamp and therefore its brightness. You have to be a bit careful with this method because the colour temperature of the lamp also decreases as it gets dimmer and it can become quite orange. If this happens you can correct it by adding maybe some half colour temperature blue to bring it back to about 3200 degrees Kelvin. And perhaps the easiest way of reducing the lamp's brightness is to simply move it further away from the subject. So now let's try and put some of the things we've learnt into practice. This is the sort of setup you're going to come across frequently, lighting a person for interview or a piece to camera. And the technique we're going to use is known as a three-point lighting setup, simply because it uses three lights, a key light, a fill light and a backlight. So Mara's sitting here patiently waiting, and the first thing I'm going to do is set the key light. So Mara, just mind your eyes. And there we have the redhead switched on. Now the key light is the main source of illumination, and as a rule of thumb, it's set about 45 degrees off the camera axis and about 45 degrees above the lens. And that basically is doing the job. That's providing a perfectly good source of illumination on Mara. But what it does, if you look closely, it provides a hard nose shadow and quite a hard shadow under her chin. So it's not terribly flattering. So we can improve on that. And how I'm going to do that first is by taking a piece of Lee 216 filter, which is white diffusion. And we're going to change this hard source into a soft source. So once that's on the lamp, you can see the lights change quite dramatically. It's already softer, the shadow under her chin is somewhat diffused, and it's generally a more pleasing result. So looking at Mara, we can see the key light is doing its job quite nicely. But if you look carefully, you can see it might be an idea to raise the key light slightly. The soft shadow from Mara's nose now falls a bit steeper and follows the contour of her cheekbone, and so that it blends more naturally into the face. So now that we've set the key light, it's a good idea to come back to the camera and adjust the exposure. So I've got a colour monitor here set up, which I've already calibrated to colour bars. So I know this is a true reflection of the exposure. So I'm going to adjust the iris on the camera, and whilst looking at the monitor, I'm going to expose the lit side of Mara's face so that it's correctly exposed, so it's not overexposed and equally not too dark. And that looks about right. So once I've set that, I'm not going to worry about the dark side of Mara's face, the shadows here, or the background, because what I'm going to do now is go back on the set and adjust those things with lighting. So I'm going to put a fill light in here to lighten these shadows. So having set the exposure now, you shouldn't need to actually alter the iris on the camera again, because any adjustments we're going to make to our brightness is going to be made through using our lights. So now I'm going to reduce the shadows further by adding a fill light. Now this comes from the opposite side to the key light and is always a soft source because we definitely don't want to add more shadows. Now a good way of doing this is to bounce a light off a reflector and this is a reflector you can get from most good photographic shops and it's a very useful thing to have in your lighting kit. So I've got a small Dido light here which I'm going to now bounce off the reflector, placing it carefully there. And what that's doing is it's lightening the shadows on the side of Mara's face. And by angling this reflector here, I can very easily adjust precisely the amount of fill light that's filling those shadows. 
And I don't want to put too much in there because I don't want to actually destroy all of the modelling that's coming from the key light. So that looks about right to me. So finally, I'm going to add a backlight. Now a backlight goes behind the subject and generally on the opposite side from the key light. And the backlight lights Mara's hair and shoulders and gives separation from the background. One thing you've got to be quite careful of is that this backlight doesn't cause flare in your lens. And you can make sure this doesn't happen by adjusting the barn door here so that any light falling on the lens of the camera is masked off. It's usually a hard source and the idea is that you point it at the top of Mara's head and make sure it covers her hair and the shoulders here and finally go back to the monitor and just check the exposure, make sure everything looks okay. So that's basic three-point lighting. It's usually simple to achieve and most of the time it will produce an acceptable and generally pleasing result but there are a number of ways in which we can further improve this setup. At the moment, we're using a redhead with diffusion on as our key light. And I'd like to make that even softer by using a redhead, but this time with a softbox. So what I've got here is a softbox on the front of an 800 watt redhead. And the diffusion material fits at the front of this softbox with Velcro. So it's very easy to set up. And what this does is it changes the small point source, the hard source of the redhead, into a large soft source. Now obviously there's a small payoff because you get a reduction in light output, but there's still plenty of punch and certainly enough for a key light in a studio situation like this. So I've placed this softbox now as Mara's key light and I've had to move it a little closer to compensate for the reduced brightness. But actually that's no bad thing, because the closer you bring the soft source, the softer it becomes. So you can see that even without fill light or backlight, this soft box is producing a lovely soft effect on Mara's face. The shadows are soft, there's plenty of modelling, and it's a really pleasing effect. But now I'm going to go on and add fill light and backlight as before. So now I'm going to set the fill light, and this time I'm using this polystyrene sheet instead of the reflector as before. And it's just to show you that you don't necessarily have to go out and buy a photographic reflector, but if you go to a builder's merchants, you can get some polystyrene sheet like this and cut it to size. It's cheap, versatile, and it does the job very well. And as before, if I just adjust the angle of this, you can see that the fill light can be controlled quite precisely until I get just the right amount of fill light I need. And then the last thing to do is add the backlight again, as before. So far, we've been using a black background for this setup. And this is so we've been able to concentrate on the light on Mara's face. But most of the time, you'll have a background different from this. You might have a wall in a room or an office, or perhaps your own studio setup. So what we've done now is replaced our black background with a piece of colour armour paper. Now one golden rule is to keep your subject as far from your background as possible. In this way you can control the light on the background separately from the subject. And also if your subject's too close to the background you'll find you get unwanted shadows from your key light falling on the background. Now with this small Dido light here I'm going to put a light on the background behind Mara and you can immediately see that this gives a lot more separation and depth to the whole shot and at this stage now you can start to experiment with colours. So just for demonstration I'll show you a piece of dark blue which gives a very nice effect. I mean you can use any colour you like. We've also got a piece of mauve gel here which just is a nice effect too. Another advantage of using a backdrop is that I've been able to place the backlight directly behind Mara, so the stand's now hidden behind the colour armour. So now we've got four lights on the set. We've got a key light, fill light, backlight, 
and we've just added a set light. But now I'm going to introduce a fifth light and that's known as the kicker. And I've got here an 800 watt redhead. On the front of that, I've put a piece of 216 full diffusion filter just to soften it out a bit. And what a kicker does is it extends the backlight around the side of Mara's face. So the backlight here is providing a nice backlight on Mara's shoulders, head, and this shoulder here. And the kicker just comes in from the side a little bit more and puts this nice highlight on the side of Mara's face here and just shows off the cheekbone and generally gives a nice lift to the side of the face. So just to recap on what all these lights are doing, I'm going to turn them all off and then turn them on individually so you can see what job each one does. So we'll start with the key light and then the fill light and the backlight and the set light and finally the kicker. So what we've got here is another common lighting situation. Lighting for two people, sat down, having a discussion. So we've got Philip and we've got Mara sitting there having a chat and we have to light for two camera positions so that we can shoot the close-up of Philip from a camera over there and then the corresponding close-up of Mara from a camera over here. Now you may do it all at the same time if you have two cameras or you may do it single camera and then move the camera here and do those close-ups again. But either way, if you do it this way, you'll be able to keep the same lighting set up so it's easier. So the way I've done this is to use a key light over here, which is providing the key light for Philip, but also because it comes from behind Mara, it's providing a hair light, a backlight for Mara. And similarly over here, the key light, which is for Mara, is providing a backlight on Philip's hair here. So each of these two key lights are in fact doing two jobs. They're a key light and they're a backlight at the same time. The third light we've got on this setup is the softbox out front here, which is a redhead through a softbox and that's providing an overall soft fill which just softens out the shadows and also provides light for a third camera position which would be here if you want to shoot a two shot of the two people sat there. So just to move away from the more formal type of lighting, the talking heads we've been doing so far, I'm going to show you now um, a small drama style setup. And really it's just to show you what you can achieve quite simply with a few lights. So the scene I've created here is Mara sitting at her desk working quite late into the evening. She's lit by the desk lamp and she's also lit by the blue moonlight which is coming through the windows from somewhere. Now the way I've achieved this is to take this lamp here which is a Dido it's got a small soft box on it. And if you want, we can call this our key light. It's our main source of illumination for this scene. And the idea is that the key light is coming from the same direction as the practical light, which you can see in vision. So the key light is motivated by this light. So what we're effectively creating is that this light here is casting light up onto Mara's face. Whereas in reality, of course, we've got our light outside of the shot doing that job so we can create it, we can control its brightness, etc. So that's the key light giving light onto Mara's face. And that really is basically it. But the way we've created the mood in this set is to not use very much fill light. So we've got light on this side and we've got shadows on the other side. After all, it is night, so there's going to be shadows. And the other way of creating the mood is the colour of the moonlight. So I've achieved that by having a reflector place here above Mara's head. There's another Dido and it's got a medium blue gel on it up into the reflector and it bounces down and causes this moonlight to cast the moonlight effect on Mara's head here and the shoulder. And I further supplemented the moonlight effect by having another Dido light placed out front. It's got the same blue on it for the moonlight effect. It's pointing at that reflector and the lights then bounce back into this side of Mara and onto the desk. So it puts light on Mara's dark side here. It also puts a little bit of light on the book spines and the little trophy in the foreground. Not very much light because of course we don't want to overlight this. If we do that we'll simply reduce the shadows and it'll no longer look dark. And finally the light on the background here is simply a slash of blue which 
we're saying, for argument's sake, is a chink in the curtains letting some moonlight through. And that's coming from this Dido light here. And it's simply switched on. It's got the same blue gel on it. I've had to actually add a piece of neutral density gel here to bring the intensity down to the right level. And then the barn doors are simply closed right up to create this slot of light. And then you can alter the angle of the light just by twisting the barn doors until it looks about right. So that's a basic, very simple, but quite effective drama setup. Something you may have heard about is the green screen process. And what this does is when you get to your edit, it allows you to take out the green background and replace that green background with other footage or say a graphics background. Now, what we have to know is how to light for a green screen shot. And what we've got here is a background which is chroma key green. It's a very specific green, not just any green. This is made by Lasterlite and it's made just for this purpose. You have to be careful not to overlight the green screen. What we're after is a very good saturated green, a deep colour, and that's going to give you a much better chance of keying it out in the edit suite later. If you do overlight it, in effect what you're doing is overexposing the green background, and therefore it becomes washed out and less green. The other thing to note about it is, it's got to be very evenly lit. There can't be any hot spots or dark spots in it. So the way I've achieved that is to have two blondes out here, two 2000 watt blondes. They've each got trace on them to soften the light out and they're pointing directly back at the green screen. If I took them out to the sides too far, what that could do is exaggerate any creases that are in this green screen. So we want to keep them around the front as much as possible. The other thing, as I said before, is to make sure you've got maximum separation between your subject and your background. Primarily because if you, if you don't do that, you're going to find a shadow being cast on the green screen. You can see me here. I'm casting a shadow on the green screen because I'm too close. Mara is sitting there. She's miles away from the green screen. No shadow problems at all. So the lighting on Mara is the same as before. We've got the key light, bounce light, a kicker, and we've got a backlight. But there's a small difference here. I've put a filter on the backlight. And the reason for this is that sometimes you can get light reflected off the green screen, coming back and hitting the subject's shoulder and hair. And the gel I've put on here is called Minus Green or Magenta. And what that does is it counteracts any green spill that's coming back on the subject. So that's lighting for green screen. Always use gloves when adjusting barn doors. They can get very hot. Make sure all of your lamps are fitted with either safety wire or safety glass. It's a good idea to put a sandbag on the base of your stands to make them more stable. Make sure you've got enough cable to run neatly down the side of the stand. If you don't do this, you can cause a trip hazard. And it's also a good idea to take the cable securely to the studio floor. Always use the right stand for the lamp. Never be tempted to put a two kilowatt blonde on a stand that's made for a Dido. What I've given you here are the basic principles which you can use when lighting situations similar to the ones I've demonstrated. These are common everyday scenarios which you'll come across quite frequently, but you can adapt these techniques to other lighting situations. There are no hard and fast rules with lighting, so please feel free to experiment with key light positions, with hard and soft light, key to fill ratios to create different moods, and adding colour to your gels on backgrounds to give your backgrounds more interest. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and I wish you every success with your lighting.